Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 244, recorded Monday, April 4th, 2016. Bill Atkinson. Triangulation is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers 1,300 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for you, our audience, the first two months are completely free when you sign up at curiositystream.com slash twit and use the promo code twit. And by Scorebig. Pay less for quality seats to your favorite sporting and music events. Go to scorebig.com, click on the microphone, and enter the promo code triangulation to save $20 off your first ticket purchase. And by DigitalOcean. Simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit digitalocean.com. And once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code triangulation in the billing section to get your $10 credit. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology, spend some time with them and with you, and you're the third part of the triangle, so get in the chat room if you're watching live at irc.twit.tv, because I know you're going to want to ask questions, I'm going to want to ask questions, of one of my, literally, heroes, and I mean that absolutely sincerely. Uh, I, if I say the name Bill Atkinson and you're a Macintosh user, I'm sure you recognize mm -hmm. the creator of QuickDraw, the, the primitives, the drawing primitives in the first Macintosh, of Mac Paint, the first amazing app in the Macintosh, of, uh, of HyperCard, the program that changed the world and in many ways inspired the World Wide Web. Uh, Bill Atkinson, it's such a pleasure to meet you. And you know what I love? We've been talking for 20 minutes already. The enthusiasm you still have for what you're doing is wonderful. You remind me of Waz nice. in that respect. You're oh, yeah. still in joy about everything. How do you do it? Well, I'm not always in joy. I have to admit that sometimes I have my fallow periods when I'm kind of depressed. But um, when I'm in a good period, I try to use it well. You know, I think it's good for you to say that because I think there are people who see people like you and Waz and say, gosh, they must always be on. Their, uh, Robin Williams is a very a, a good yeah. example of this. Gosh, they must always be happy and on, and they, you don't ever see the quiet downsides yeah. because people retreat during those times. But so many geniuses going back, uh, I think, thousands of years have those ups and downs. Um, I found the best medicine for me yeah. is working on a project. Yeah. If I'm, when I'm working on a project, I don't think about whether I'm happy or not. I just am happy because yeah. I'm creating. I'm making something. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And when the project's over, is there a, a little bit of a letdown? Is that? Oh, of course. Yeah. It's just, you know, postpartum blues, like Post having, having a baby. And postpartum, it is. <laughs> you must have felt a little bit of that when the Macintosh shipped in 1984. That must yeah. have just been like, <gasps> how long did you work on that? Um, well, let's see, I came to Apple in 78, April of 78. So it was a very new oh, company at that time. It was only a two-year-old company. I brought Bill brought toys, by the way. The show and tell we're going to have today I brought is awesome. My Apple badge. Oh, look at this. <laughs> look at that. April 78. You, employee 51. You still have it. And that was Apple was two years old. It's just celebrated yeah. its 40th birthday. So 38 years ago. You were you know, in the advanced technology. You know, it's employee 51. Yeah. But there were only 30 people there. Well, who were the rest of these? It's an interesting thing about the employee numbers. When they first started, so they didn't have them for a couple of years. They right. instigated them several years later. When they start, first started dealing them out, Steve Jobs took employee number one. Oh, no, no, uh, sorry, Wozniak took employee number one. And Steve was kind of Steve a little pissed. pissed, and so he <laughs> took employee number zero. <laughs> and so when we were kind of kidding around, we'd be in the hall, and he'd be coming down the hall, and we'd say, here comes the big zero. <laughs> <laughs> Under your breath, I'm sure, one wouldn't want to incur the wrath of Jobs. Oh, so he, before, he would have understood. He got it. Yeah, and uh, after it's all, it's kind of petty to not, you know, share the place with. Except us. programming starts with zero, so it's okay, right? Arrays yeah. start with zero, so that's not a wrong Except, thing to do. Except, you know, in HyperCard, when you say go to card one, that's the first it card. It is the first card. The third card is card number three. 
That's too so obvious. So humans yeah. deal with one-based counting. Right. Computers, arrays and stuff, count zero-based. Right. You have to understand who's going to interact with it in order to do the right numbering system. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. The first card is number one, not number zero. You studied with Jeff Raskin. Yeah. Uh, this was in college or in graduate school? In college. Yeah. I was uh, at the University of California in San Diego. Mm -hmm. I was working on my degree in chemistry and biochemistry. Oh, interesting. Not math or computer science. No, no, I wasn't a computer science guy. I didn't. I, computers are a tool. <laughs> right. I use them to, to do work with, to do stuff, but right. I didn't really... I don't think of myself as a computer scientist. I think of right. just as an engineer that uses computers as a tool. That makes sense. And um, I met Jeff, and we were good friends, and I even lived at his house for a while. Um, and... Later, when I was in my graduate studies, I was almost finishing my PhD in neuroscience up at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle. Jeff sent me this note, or maybe he called me, I think he called me. He said, you've got to come down and uh, see what's happening down here. There's this really cool thing starting up with Apple. That was the advanced technology and group, wasn't I it? I said, yeah. well, it's before they had advanced didn't technology even have ATG, group, yeah. right? The, so um, I said, I have to finish my PhD or I won't have the credentials to do research. I mm -hmm. want to research how does the brain work. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you can't drive a car if you don't get the driver's license. Right. If you want to do research in a lab, you have to get a PhD. You have to, you know, ha that's a necessary um, Piece ingredient, of paper. Yeah. A, a credential. Yeah. And he didn't take no for an answer. So he sent me round trip airfare and said, just come and visit for a weekend. No strings attached, and the airfare wasn't refundable. And I figured, well, my dad lives down in Los Gatos. I could, I could just stay with him, and what the heck. So I came down for a weekend. And Steve Jobs, I don't know what, it, what Raskin said to Jobs, that, you know, what bug he put in his ears, but Steve spent the whole day recruiting me. Wow. He took me around and introduced me to each person at Apple. There were 30 people there. Mm -hmm. And they seemed intelligent. They seemed like they were having fun. And they seemed really kind of passionate. They were trying, almost evangelical. They wanted to make uh, computing safe for people. They wanted to make it so it would be fun to use a computer. And I enjoyed talking to them. But what really got me toward the end of the day, Steve pulled his magic. And what he said, he says, OK, up in Seattle, you read about some hot new technology. And really, that was made two years ago. You're just at the end of a distribution delay when people get to buy something, it's something that was actually invented two years prior. If you want to change the future, you have to be ahead of that lag. And the, the graphical image he stuck in my head, he said, think how fun it is to surf on the front edge of a wave. Uh, and how not fun to dog paddle on the tail end of the same yeah, wave. Yeah. And that's kind of stuck in my head. And he said, you know, come to Apple where we're inventing the future and you can have an impact. How can you say no to that? Well, I didn't. Two weeks later, I was working at Apple, and I never finished my PhD. My dad, an MD, was really upset that I'd turned my back on 10 years of college. Yeah. Um, but I ended up having a lot of fun at Apple, uh, making contributions, and I don't, I don't regret it at all. We're going to take a break. Bill Atkinson is our guest. I'm so glad you're here for this show, uh, and I, uh, I hope you're enjoying it. I have lots more to talk about. Uh, if you are a curious mind, if you are interested in the world, I think you'll be very interested in our brand new sponsor, Curiosity Stream. It's the world's first ad-free, non-fiction streaming service. It was founded by the, the, the guy who put together Discovery, Discovery Communications, John Hendricks. Uh, the library is growing really fast. It has three, 1,300 titles right now. They tripled in less than a year. More coming all the time. This is not a U.S.-only product. It's available in 196 countries. That's pretty much everywhere. On web, on Roku, on Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, Apple TV app is on the way. You're going to want to put Curiosity Stream on your Apple TV as soon as you can. Lots of science and technology content, nature, history, 50-plus hours of 4K content. So if you're one of those people who just got a 4K TV and you're looking for something to put on it, this is one of the largest 4K libraries on the Internet. Stephen Hawking's Universe, Next World featuring Michio Kaku. I know you watch the people who watch this show are interested in this kind of stuff. The Human Face of Big Data, 
We mm. we had Rick uh, Smolin on just uh, a few a few weeks ago. The road to the singularity, what we're talking about right now, Jason Silver and other experts. You get a monthly plan and an annual plan. Uh, it starts at just two ninety nine a month. So you're getting, for less than a cup of coffee, you're getting food for your mind. CuriosityStream.com slash twit. When you use the promo code twit during sign-up, you'll get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free, not for a week or a month, but for 60 days, two entire months free. So that's plenty of time to watch all those 4K videos. Go to CuriosityStream.com slash twit and sign up. Thank you. I didn't know about that. I didn't either until they came to us and said, we, we, you know, we want to launch this. We want to get this out to the uh, world. And we know that your audience is really, you know, interested in learning. Well, I do still keep up with the neuroscience. I read neuroscience and I keep on track. Well, I know you and Jeff learn. Hawkins have, or, or, yeah. or have uh, communicated about that. We've had Jeff on the show talking about Numenta and about his design or his de plans to create a processors that work like human brains. Yeah. It's fascinating. The human brain is a really good design. Yeah. And we can learn a lot by um, modeling Neo, the, the architecture of neocortex. You think so? Because that's, of Absolutely. course, a great debate. Is, should we make von Neumann machines, tur you know, Turing machines, deterministic machines, or should we try to do something massively parallel as, as the human brain is? That's okay. slower, but... So the fallacy in programming is you tell it what to do. Right. The fallacy is it doesn't really know what it's yeah. doing. And when it encounters any kind of situation the programmer didn't actively anticipate and program in, it's out of luck. He can't figure out what right. to do. It fails, yeah. And so programming, as we know it, is very brittle. Yes. If you didn't tell it to expect this situation, right. it can't deal with it. Right. Now that's very different than what we do with our children. We, Our children <laughs> no have, <laughs> they're, when they're born, they're not total tabula rasa. They do have some instincts, right. as any animal does. Right. But the neocortex is pretty much erased, or not trained yet. Right. Most of what we know we learn during the course of our life from right. our experiences in life. So anything that's higher level knowledge like math or physics or chemistry or poetry or music or economics, that's all stuff that's been stored in neocortex by experiences in life. Mm -hmm. Pattern matching. and Right, so we yeah. set up a learning environment. And instead of programming our children, yeah. we set up an environment, we try to give them enriched uh, access to experiences that will help them to learn. Right. And we try to give them some decent models. Right. You know, a, kind of like you would do behavior. with neural networks with an AI. Is one hopes that they would learn that way, but you're still using Except these brittle the, tools. The neural networks, they missed something really important. Yeah. So the structure of the neocortex, and this is what neuroscientists will learn. Uh, Jeff Hawkins, uh, out of his money from Palm Pilot and all those guys, funded the Redwood Neurosciences Institute right. and hired... And, and basically paid to have scientists come from all over the wor world for a regular colloquium on how does the neocortex work, mm. particularly how does the cortical column work. Mm -hmm. It turns out that within neocortex, the basic module of learning is a cortical column. And a cortical column learns really only two things. Well, I'm grossly simplifying and understand. Okay. Yeah. But it learns patterns of simultaneous firing of inputs and temporal sequences of those patterns. For example, um, let's say you had a, a Christmas tree with a whole lot of blinking lights on it. And in the next room over, there's a kid who's got control over the plugs to the strings of lights. Mm -hmm. But in this room, they can't even see the wires. But they see that uh, even though they're all blinking, these, this group comes and goes together. And people in the room, without being told, will know that there's common causality. Mm -hmm. the, that, that's pattern A. Mm -hmm. And then here's another one, it's pattern B, when the kid unplugs the second. Mm -hmm. And if the, the kid does A and then B and then C and waits a while and then does A and a B and C and it waits a while, three or four cycles into it, people in room are gonna say, well, there goes A, I bet B and C are about to right. happen. So that is temporal sequencing and that's what the neural network guys they're, missed. They're inference so, engines, in effect. They're inferring. It's, it's time-based uh, uh, prediction. Uh, rather. So the brain, its basic job is to build a model of the world yeah. sufficiently complex that it can anticipate Predict. what's going to happen right. next. Right. Keep you from getting eaten by the saber tooth. Right. And so this, um, this, the cortical column then gives out, I think we're in sequence A, B, C as its recognition. Now it also takes, that's the upward, the recognition uh, side of it, it also takes a prediction from a higher level and makes live input and takes a more specific prediction. Mm. 
you, uh, somebody above says, I think we're in sequence A, B, C, you're currently looking at an A, you predict a B. Right. And that, then where the power is in neocortex is putting these together in a hierarchy. Mm. So imagine in this Christmas tea situation, there's another party going on on the next floor up. Mm -hmm. And each bulb in this, or each output of this tree that says, I think we're in sequence A, B, C, that's one of the bulbs in the next tree. Mm. And so what happens is when you're recognizing faces in only four levels of forward only recognition, uh, your V4 is recognizing sequences of patterns, of sequences of patterns, of sequences of right. patterns, of sequences of patterns. Right, right. That's what general architecture gives the ability to learn very complex things that weren't anticipated. And evolution stumbled onto that and replicated it. Right. The neocortex, with a few minor exceptions, like the olfactory cortex is a little bit older and only five layers, but everywhere else it's the same six layers and the same really? functionality. Wow. Uh, neuroscientist Vernon Mountcastle said, if we got, wherever we dissect the brain and stain it and look at the layers, it got the same structure everywhere. Oh, interesting. If we got the same hardware everywhere, maybe there's one common cortical algorithm. That's now known to be true. So, so by it seems making, like that would be easy to model. Exactly, exactly. So what Jeff Hawkins said is, instead of looking at the micro details of the ion channels and, yeah. and, and the action potential propagation, let's just look at the overall black box behavior, functional diagram of the system. Right. The input-output relations. So let's make a software simulation of a cortical column and it will take inputs wow. and recognize simultaneous input patterns. Mm -hmm. And then it'll uh, recognize sequences, temporal sequences of those. It'll come out with a prediction of what sequence we're in. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to use wet neurons. You can use, and, and imp, imp, uh, modeling the neurons would be a stupid thing to do. You can use software that does, that accomplishes the same input-output relationship using sparse matrices and mm -hmm. Bayesian belief propagation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, when you get a prediction from above and live input making a more specific prediction, that's again using computer techniques like uh, hidden Markov models and things like that. You can make a software equivalent of, or software simulation of a cortical column. And you can take biology and keep tweaking the biology, modify it and see how it changes its output. Mm -hmm. Modify, if, mm. if your simulation doesn't, then you fix your simulation. Once you have a pretty good simulation of a cortical column, then you can make a non-biological neocortex by deploying a network of nodes. They call this a hierarchical temporal memory system, HTM. It's just a set of nodes where each node is running a copy of the cortical column simulation. And you, Do they you deploy well? nodes yeah. and you deploy levels of them yeah. and you connect them together. And now the output of this will feed into that mm. level and that will feed into and that level. Massive structure. You get one. the hierarchy yeah. like neocortex has. Yeah. And you get this basic module of learning which is recognizing patterns of simultaneous firing right. and sequences of those patterns. When you do that, you end up with something that can learn like a human brain wow. can learn. And are we doing this? Is yes. Jeff doing this? So Jeff first started with um, this Redwood Neurosciences yeah. Institute. And when they got pretty much the, they really knew how a cortical column works to a practical point. He gave them another big chunk of money to go continue theoretical research at the Helen Willis Foundation mm -hmm. up in Cal Berkeley. And he founded Numenta right. for a new mind, new mi Numenta. And his take was that to get people to use a new technology, you have to make a um, a game where people can play in it and do things interesting and make money doing it. Right. There has to be a business right. proposition for a lot of companies right. to jump in and use it. So he um, founded f um, Numenta with the idea of let's make these HTMs available to everybody. So he, his team put together the first operating system for HTMs to run in. So as a programmer, now how do you program an HTM? You don't tell it, do this, do this, do this. That's the wrong thing. Right. Instead, you set up some nodes and levels and basic connections, and you feed it a lot of data. Give it information, yeah. Right. So let's say you wanted to figure out where to drill for oil. Right. You would take your data about, I mean, as an analyst, you would know that 
maybe echosonograms would be useful and right. satellite photos right. and certainly data about where you've drilled for oil and found it before would be useful. You take half of all your data and you feed it to the system and you feed it the answers at the top. Right. Because these come to a consensus. Right. The predictions and the recognitions right. come to a consensus such that now if you feed the second half of your data where you know the right answer, but you're not going to tell it, right. then you look at the output and see if it matches what you know to be correct. Once it does, this thing has learned wow. the relationship. And it, what it's, it's not Matt and Mubbo Jumbo, it's just recognizing spatial and temporal patterns sure, of a sure. complex nature sure. that we might not recognize just looking at piles of data. Sure. Um, and so programming becomes more of kind of a systems analysis job where you're not more telling it data, what to do, code, you're yeah. understanding yeah. the, the, the the area right. of knowledge and knowing what kind of measurements might be useful to it and uh, feeding it those, training it, and then verifying Can it. you get to a general intelligence from that point? Or is it always going to be uh, very specific domains? Well, let's look at what's happened in neocortex. We have everything that's higher level intelligence is stored in a neocortex. Right. Um, we do so with about a million and a half cortical columns. That's all humans have. A uh, human cortical column is about 60,000 neurons. Uh, rats is maybe 10,000. Mm -hmm. And we have maybe 15 to 20,000 inputs per each. But so it's not really everything... a massive machine, oh, is it? Oh, no. So if you look at a, a, a chimp's neocortex, it's about that area. Mm -hmm. Humans is about that. Mm -hmm. The difference, and we don't have any major structures that the chimp doesn't have. It's not, we, we share 99% of the DNA. What the difference, I think, is, is going from this much neocortex to this much has allowed structured language with writing and syntax and has allowed us to become a communal organism. We build on each other's shoulders yeah. Yeah. in a way that a chimp never will. Right. It's our ability, we've transcended our individuality right. to become a humanity is a group organism that builds in a cumulative fashion. Right. Now, there's some fundamental limitations about wet neurons. Like 200 times a second is about all a neuron can fire. It's a refractory period before it repolarizes. It little pumps have to pull the sodium and potassium back across to the other side of the membrane. Well, if 200 a second is what neurons fire, our current computers are around 10 million times faster than that. And in 10 years, maybe 20 years, you could expect our computers to be 10 billion times faster than that. Now, area-wise, if this to this made language possible. <laughs> what would happen if you could have a square kilometer of cortex? <laughs> now, I don't see that happening in a biological being. No. <laughs> but I do see it happening in within 10 years in yeah. a, a non-biological cortex. Cow. And we have no idea what structure. Now, you say, will it be intelligent? Right. So I think of it this way. We invented tools to um, uh, empower us, to amplify our abilities. Uh, Steve Jobs used to talk about this uh, scientific American study that looked at the efficiency of locomotion of all these right. different species. Right. And, you know, humans weren't particularly the top. The condor whooped ass over us. Yeah. But the scientific American guys put in a ringer, <laughs> put in an artificial species, which is human with bicycle, right. which whooped ass over the condor. Right. So we make tools like microscopes to extend our vision. We make yep. telescopes. We make... Bicycles uh, for the mind. Yes. In fact... Uh, Steve used to refer to the Mac as a bicycle for the mind. Right. And, um, oh, somebody put up a cartoon in, in, we had in the lab that was a, a brain sitting on a wheelchair. And we said, wheelchairs for the mind. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Let's not do but, that one. <laughs> so imagine we could make something, uh, sort of an oracle, that could do a much better prediction of yeah. the consequences of actions. Yeah. If we could consult this, in, this thing that more accurately could see based on the course of everything that's gone before, the likely outcome of doing this versus doing that. We might not have chosen to go to Iraq. Right. A super prediction <laughs> machine. Yeah. 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 So is it going to be more intelligent? Okay. Neocortex isn't all of what makes a human human. We do have emotions and right. feelings, and these are happening down at the limbic system and lower right. levels. Um, you wouldn't get a human out of it. What you would get is a box that could do pattern recognition much right. better than humans can do it. Could play Go, for instance. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, so I don't see these artificial intelligences as 
uh, something that's become our our, our uber lord and not we're, threatening we're, in other words well life is heavily symbiotic we are the direct descendants through many generations of the blue green algae right and there are a lot of genes in the blue green algae that we have mm -hmm. we wouldn't be here if the blue green algae wasn't here and at any one point there's there's been a sort of passing of the torch of consciousness and always multiple beings that have different kinds of consciousness i don't think that process of evolution is done and it may go we are a step along the way into technology it well tools may think become of it, the next you can think of a human as a hybrid organism. Mm -hmm. We are partly the DNA we rode in on, mm -hmm. but partly the technology that we've created, mm -hmm. the culture and technology that we load ourselves from. Mm -hmm. our, our culture is a big hard drive, mm -hmm. and we get a small mm -hmm. ROM and a big hard drive. A wildebeest has a big ROM and a small hard drive. Right. Wildebeest, uh, uh, a, uh, a little one can be born and pick up and run the same day. Right. Humans are pretty helpless for the first few years, right. and that's on purpose. The reason is so that we can increase the amount of neocortex. Humans are born grossly uh, premature. They're not developed like a wildebeest is, but they have a lot more capacity to learn from their environment, which makes them much more flexible. They can learn about cell phones, smartphones right. that didn't exist when they were born. Right. Turns out it's an evolutionary advantage. Yes, and that uh, that, uh, that process is called neoteny. Yeah. So anyway, this is I think um, uh, an exciting area. Uh, it can be frightening, uh, but you can also think about it as um, it's evolution. Evolution, the same process of evolution that's been going on. Yeah. That was greatly accelerated by language to become instead of requiring a change in the DNA, we can make a change in culture right. and get feedback in 50s of years to find right. out whether that was a good idea. Maybe free love didn't work out so well because right. people got AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. No, but that's true. But language but, is a technology. Whereas language genetic not, changes yeah. are really um, kind of random and slow right. and blundering. Right. Whereas technology, technological changes are not only faster to get feedback, but they're directed evolution. Right. Where you choose a goal and aim for it and say, well, we want to be this. And that's not the way um, natural selection and random mutations uh, work. They don't have a goal. Right. We're taking so control of our evolution. what will happen? So uh, mankind has become the dominant species on the planet because of language writing technology we've we've built in a cumulative fashion what will happen when the this hybrid of biology and technology what happens when it splits mm -hmm. when instead of having neurons that only go 200 times a second what if we have a purely technological be being uh, artificial intellect if you will that could evolve thousands of times faster than humans can now with their technology. Now you're scaring me, because we're obsolete. I don't think we're obsolete. I think we're still part of the, you know, the blue-green algae We're blue-green algae. <laughs> blue-green algae, st we still need blue-green algae to True. make oxygen. <laughs> True. They made the oxygen we'll we have breathe. A job. May not we be will still have a job. We might have more time to do art, and yeah. we might have to, more time yeah. to do music and, and uh, sort of uniquely human pursuits. Right, right. Um, but I don't think that this process is something that humans can stop. It's not like you can say, well, we'll, we'll put the brakes on this and yeah. hide it in a corner here yeah. because it will happen. Yeah. And it's better that a lot of people have access to it than only a few. Um, there's a lot more damage will be done right. by only a few having. For example, um, the Numenta work is all open source. That's great. And it, it scares me when I think, you know, there's an Iranian HTM group. Right. Yes, right. but there's all these other, you right. know, there's, there right. are, are 50,000 groups using the HDM technology. But what you don't want is it to be in some corporate dark lab somewhere where it's not being shared with the world. It's you being, don't want it to be owned only to, by the Pentagon. To advantage somebody. Only by the Pentagon. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think we're in for some interesting times. Ten years is soon. We might even make it. <laughs> I look forward to that. Boy, this isn't exactly what I thought we would be talking about today. Doesn't matter. This is great. <laughs> Bill Atkinson is our guest. He is a legend, and you can see why his mind is still actively roaming the universe to find new and interesting things. He's a, an incredible photographer, an artist. Uh, he's got a, an app.
which is a uh, height. We made it an app cap some time ago when it first came out. Photo card. Photo card. We'll talk about that. But I want to get back to Jeff Raskin. We didn't. Sure. We didn't. We, I want to talk a little because I think Jeff is maybe a little underappreciated nowadays and, mm -hmm. and needs to be better known by a new okay. generation of people yeah. who really have a lot to thank him for. Do you yeah. feel that way? Um, I think Jeff taught me that the computer isn't the important thing, right. that the people are. That's right. That he was a uh, At the time yeah. I met Jeff, um, the way you interacted with a computer was at a key punch, you made decks right. of cards and you brought them over to this big computer center and you submitted them and you came back the next day and there was a printout that showed you had a semicolon in the wrong place and you had to right. do it all over again. And Jeff um, took his, he was in the visual arts department, not computer science. And he took his budget for computing money and said, let's use this money to set up a little um, interactive environment where he bought bean bags and he bought uh, some da data general Nova computers running uh, a basic interpreter and video displays that you could type wow. and see your basic program and try it right away. And it was interactive programming. And his students got a lot better experience with writing code because they could do something and try it right away. Right. Right. Now, the computer center was kind of upset with him because they were <laughs> counting on his portion of the budget. For <laughs> we don't have no bean bags here. <laughs> well, uh, he, was the, he was the guy he was the pioneer who that wanted way. to make computers for the rest of us. And, uh, and you were very much uh, an implementer who made it happen. And we want to talk about those early days at Macintosh. The notion that the computer be sitting there idle all the time waiting for, gee, did he move anything? Did he do anything? Did he the touch anything? Yeah. That event loop is completely wasteful of computer resources. But it's not wasteful of human resources. Yeah. It's okay to have a yeah. processor waiting, waiting on your you. hand and foot. Yeah, We're talking with uh, Bill Atkinson. Man, this is such a thrill. Uh, we'll have more in just a second, but first a word from our sponsor. You know, it happens all the time. There's a concert, there's a show you want to go to. And, uh, you, you know, by the time I heard about, I don't know, Prince performing uh, in Oakland, it, it, those were all sold out. And I thought, I'm going to never get tickets. And then I thought about scorebig.com. You know, it turns out, this is, this is something they don't want you to know, the venues and the artists don't want you to know, but about 40% of all live events go, the live event tickets, 40% of all live event tickets go unsold. That they're, and of course, nobody's gonna say, oh, we're not sold out, want some tickets? No, they go to Score Big. Score Big makes it easy to attend live events, working directly with your favorite teams and your artists to get their unsold seats to you at unpublished prices. At Scorebig, you're always guaranteed huge savings by paying much less than what the box office charges for tickets. Incredible deals to concerts, sports games, Broadway productions, family-friendly events. First place I go when I want to go to an event is Scorebig.com. They have a really nice name your ticket price feature where you say, I'm, gonna pay, I'm offering this much. And you receive an answer from Scorebig instantly. You can save up to 60% that way. But you can also have an option to pay a fixed price, still much less expensive than major online ticket resellers. And there, this is important because most of these other guys, they, they show one price, but then you get to check out and they say, oh, and by the way, here's our fees. Service fees. Service and fees, $800. Shipping and <laughs> yeah, not with Scorebig. You, free shipping, no surprise fees. The price you see is the price you pay. You can also, and I do this all the time, favorite shows and events so you'll be notified when mm. those dates are upcoming to attend great seat prices too low to publish that's scorebig.com so i know the giants home openers coming up i'll be right after the show going to score big to get my tickets the next time you're planning to attend a gamer show visit score big first see how much you can save scorebig.com up in the upper right hand corner now, on my computer, for some reason, I see a ticket. On this computer, I see a microphone. But in the right-hand corner, there's something. <laughs> Click it. <laughs> and and enter the promo code triangulation. And what we're going to do is, if you put triangulation in there, give you 20 bucks off your first ticket purchase. That's scorebig.com. Promo code is triangulation. Bill, I always want to know when my favorite, favorite artists are exactly. going to play. And often I find out after. after, and it's kind of too late to get tickets. Right. Um, I'm, uh, Who's I, your favorite artist these days? Uh, Roseanne Cash, and she's coming Love to the her. Freight and Salvage in July. Love her. In Berkeley. Yes. And um, I 
accidentally stumbled onto an announcement of her uh, Yeah, otherwise concert, you wouldn't know, right? Only a few days after the tickets were available, and I still was Perfect. able to get tickets. Yeah. But most of the time, it's the other way around. That by the time I find out that it's there, they're all sold out. Yeah. Or the only place you can get them is from $300 scalpers. Right, you know, exactly. And I don't want to pay that. Exactly. This is where the Internet really has made a difference. It's really uh, uh, smoothed out all of this commerce and transactions and marketplaces in an interesting way, I think. You know, 40 years since the founding of Apple Computer, and yep. that's kind of nice to celebrate that birthday with somebody who helped make such a difference in our lives. I brought out my Inside Macintosh ah. volumes. This, Carolyn Rose. Yeah, She's boy, my she, hero. she documented it all, and anybody who wanted to write software for the Macintosh needed this, but this is... Nowadays, you know, if you if you you can get the Windows documentation, a full API documentation, it's similar to this. But at the time, nobody had done this before. Yeah. The ROM itself was brilliant. The idea that you build a computer that has all the primitives built into it, into the hardware, to do Windows and all these things that you're doing. It blew my mind. The way you get software to be interoperable and compatible user interface is to provide tools in the ROM so that it's easier for a developer to use those tools. They can write their own one-off. She doesn't off, have to write her own. If, yeah. But if you use these, um, it, you won't have to write them. And you'll look more like the other apps. And so it'll be easier for somebody who's already learned how to yes. use one app to, to use another app. It was a, it was a wonderful, virtuous uh, circle because, of course, you had the user interface guidelines. What do you got Can there? I bring out He's this? He's got something. Yeah, okay, bring this, this out. Is, Look at this. This is uh, December 1983. Oh, man. Here, hold it up a little higher there. Actually, yeah, you know what? You I'll, manage the reflection. Yeah, there you here. go. Yeah. <laughs> that is you, this of is, course. Uh, me. I had a little more hair back then. This is 33 years ago. Wow. And that's Steve. And I look at his eyes. He's kind of got this little calculating look like, how can I harness this kid's <laughs> energy? <laughs> this is two months before the release of the Macintosh. Yeah, it came out in January, January 24, 1984. 1984. I got mine in March. I was a 100-day buyer. I went to Macy's with my credit card. I had wanted a Lisa so badly, and I couldn't afford that. But yeah. 2500 bucks. I thought, maybe I can get that. It was the first three. We all wanted it to be 1500 I know. We I know, were it was really a great disappointed. disappointed. Last yeah. minute, it got jacked up to 2400 uh, And it didn't change the world right away, I think, no. because of that price Apple point. Apple almost died. Yeah. It was a little slow. But people, got, you know, I got it. The minute I turned one on and booted it up, the minute you saw Steve turn it on and it said, hello, it was, wow. And that, by the way, that hello, that first hello written in the program you wrote, Mac Paint. Mm -hmm. So this, um, this, this computer had... 128 k bytes of semiconductor memory. Wow. This one has 128 gigabytes <laughs> of semiconductor memory. A factor of a million. A million more. A million more memory. And it isn't really that much bigger. <laughs> Uh, it's Somebody made for me, or made, I love and this. I got this. I love this. When the iPad came out, yeah. they made a Padintosh. See, it's a cover for <laughs> There's uh, the, the back of, a, of an iPad. There's it here. I'll show it over, I'll show it over here. It. Isn't that funny? You, read, you wear that on your... And by the way, I love it that you use an iPad that you... Oh, yeah. You know, I think Jeff would have... What do you think Jeff would have thought of the, uh, of the iPad? Because he wanted to make... I remember he had... His vision was... You know, uh, what, what did he call it? I can't remember. Uh, the Cannon Cat was an information appliance. An information appliance. Yeah. Uh, he had a great heart, and some of the ways that he was short-sighted was that he didn't think in terms of a platform. Yeah. And this is why Steve took the project away from him. Right. Jeff was the father of the Macintosh project. Steve was actually the father of the Macintosh, mm -hmm. and the, he, he had to take it away because he wanted to make it an open platform people could write for. The apps are what make the Mac have, worth having. And what uh, Jeff thought was, well, it's like an appliance. You, you buy a toaster and it has right. a certain set of features, and it, you don't ever That's expect it. it to do anything more. Um, Jeff wanted the Mac to have a 256 by 256 pixel display. It was cute because you could address it with a 16-bit number, any one pixel. That was kind of short-sighted. But <laughs> he, he didn't want to use the 68,000 processor. He did want a bitmap did. display. I mean, that was yeah. a, that was important. Oh, no. He was Just very early in pushing toward a bitmap display. Yeah. But um, he didn't want it to use the 68,000 processor. Really? What did he want to use? 6809, a little teeny 8-bit huh. processor that um, you know would have been cheaper yeah. but wouldn't have been able to use any of the stuff that I'd written for the Lisa. So quick draw, 
because we were using a 68,000, was pretty much a direct port. Um, I gave the sources to Andy Hertzfeld, and he did a few tweaks to them, but basically, that's cool. Uh, it in went 60, in the wrong. I think I owned. I think my code owned two th owned more or more than one third of the entire ROM. Wow, but that was more than quick draw. Or was that just quick that's quick draw? A third of the ROM was quick draw. Yeah. What was quick draw? Tell us about quick draw. Quick draw was the graphic primitives that Elisa and a Mac used. When you um, draw some text, who turns the pixels on and off? When you draw uh, lines or a shaded areas with a texture pattern, right. who turns the pixels on and off? As you a didn't programmer, want the you just applications to, to have to do that. Right. It would be really, really slow. As a programmer, you just want to say, draw a circle here, yeah. shade it 50% uh, gray. You don't want to think about how that's getting, getting right. done. Right, and it needs to be done very fast. That's the so key, isn't it? I wrote software. I, it had to be done pretty much all in assembly language, mm -hmm. and even with unrolled loops, where I'd had you know wow. a part of the code, it would know we've got to we got to do 17 uh, long words across. It would jump into a table 17 from the end of the table, so it would do it there without any decrement and branch instructions to eat up. Because that had slowed down. The computer was only. Uh, um, I think Lisa was only five megahertz processor cl uh, clock, and the yeah. Mac was eight megahertz. Right. And so what you could do in a microsecond wasn't that much. So what I wanted it to be is such that you could use um, software driving of all of the interface and do it performant enough that real applications could use it. Previously, it had been done in hardware, right? I yeah. mean, that was what, what, that was what in Apple did, What happened right? is you put one byte in a location, and a character generator ROM would read out the five by seven dot pattern right. as the the computer as the display was scanning, right. and that was very efficient, very fast. But it meant you could only do the characters that were in that ROM. Right. You couldn't do graphics. Right. Uh, there were a number of decisions that went in that were um, really based on Jeff's insistence on doing uh, an all graphical interface. The first was a white background with black text. Now before like a this, piece of paper. our computers had black backgrounds yeah. and either green white or, or green yeah. or amber. <laughs> yeah. And my argument, and the hardware guys on the Lisa team really did not want that. No because kidding. Because it would flicker more. Right. It would uh, wear out the phosphor faster. Right. It required um, it required a faster phosphor so that it wouldn't smear as you scrolled. Um, and my argument was, if you're going to do graphics. I mean, I can see inverting text going from white on black to black on white when mm -hmm. you go to print. You're never going to print on black paper. You're going to print mm -hmm. on white paper. Mm -hmm. If you want to have graphics, you're not going to want to invert them because you're, how do you know whether to invert this part and not that part? You need to have a white, you need to have a white right. background on the display so that when you print it onto white paper, it worked. Right. And it was kind of a big fight over that, and, and uh, Jobs sided with me on that. He, now, were you he with, took my argument. Were you with Steve when he went to Xerox and saw the, 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 yeah. what they were doing? Yeah. So how important was that? I mean, were you already thinking along those lines? Yeah. Yes, we were. We had already, uh, we already had software working in the lab that used a white background, that used okay. a mouse that we had gotten. You know, I used my first mouse in 1971 down at the University of California in San Diego. In Kent Wilson's chemistry lab. Wow. And, uh, but it was the Doug Engelbart type it was mouse. A Doug Eng well, it was a, a little better than the original one that was a wooden box, yeah. but it still had two uh, discs. Right. So you, you, it was kind of like an etch a sketch. You right. can't draw a 45 degree line with an etch, you can go up and over and up and over. <laughs> it was designed as a pointing device right. to point to some text. Right. But it wasn't a good drawing device. That wasn't really until. Uh, I think uh, Kelly is a design firm that worked with Apple to put the ball in they there. They thought of a ball. And the ball mouse, funnily, you could actually draw yeah. in, a, in a smooth shape. Yeah. Uh, it was, my, I actually convinced, uh, I think Tom Whitney was the manager who had to make the call, but I convinced him that the mouse had to be in the box. Why? I had worked on the Apple II a bunch, and they had these uh, game I.O. paddles that, you know, little knobs. and. Many people didn't have them, so if you wrote software, you didn't couldn't count on them. Right. And I said, how are you going to write a, uh, a graphics editing program that might have to work all by cursor keys? Can't do it. If you know they have a pointing device right. of any kind, I don't care whether it's a mouse or a tablet or, or, or something else, but if yeah. they have a pointing device, then you can do something by point and drag. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom Whitney bought into that, and that was why there was a mouse in the box. 
was there a sense as as the Macintosh is coming together over those what is it four years, uh, five years? How long did it take? You started um, in seventy see, seventy eight, and it came out in eighty four. Were you? But you were working on Lisa out before that. I was working on Lisa. Well, Lisa is the unsung hero that Macintosh was built on top of. Oh, absolutely. If the Lisa yeah. hadn't been there, the Mac wouldn't have been there. Yeah. The Lisa was priced where people couldn't afford it, but you can think of it as the prototype sure. for Mac. Sure. And um, so I started working on the Lisa right after doing the UCSD Pascal system. For well, the I was Apple curious. II. So your relationship with the UCSD was why the Apple had pass or the Mac had Actually, Pascal? Actually, not. No. Um, I did not know about the UCSD Pascal project when I was a student there. Oh. Uh, it was after I was at Apple that I found out about it, and I said, "We need to be able to have a software environment." where we can build in a cumulative fashion. That these um, sec kind recurring of theme in my life, boots, building in a cumulative bootstrap. fashion. Yeah. And what we had was a basic that was only two characters significant. You can make a long variable name, but only the first two, two first characters <laughs> count it. That's terrible. And so, it, very error prone. <laughs> okay, you could look look at the code and it looked like there were different variables, but yeah, they really were the same, same one. Variable. Oh, so we man. actually had charts zero through A, or zero through Z, by zero through Z, and we would check off which variables were used. <laughs> oh. But there was a worse problem. There were no local variables. Oh. That meant that if you wrote a module that somebody else was going to use, screw somebody else's variables. If they up. use a variable oh. that happens to have the same two characters. They screw yours. Talk about side effects. Yeah. <gasps> so I said we need a development environment that can build in a more cumulative fashion with local variables and and modern programming practices like right. Pascal. Right. And I said we have to do this. And my manager at the time said, no, we don't want to do this. Uh, people are happy with what they got. And, and I, I overrode him. I went to Jobs. And, I, and Jobs said, well, I'm not convinced. I think our users are happy with basic and assembly language. Uh, but you seem passionate about it. I'll give you one week to prove me otherwise. I was on an airplane within two hours down to UC San Diego. And I started porting right away. And uh, they had already made a 6502 interpreter. Well, it was a P system, and, right? So it didn't compile yeah. to assembly. It compiled to an interpreted code. Right. Um, kind of like Java does today. Not exactly, but the yeah. idea being it was universal. There's an there's a intermediate code there. Right. And so basically, well, all I had to do was plug in the graphics, and turtle graphics, and I had to... Well, one of the things was um, they had a, a copy bits equivalent, a, a draw block, they called it. Right. And we had this horrible mapping on the Apple II screen where adjacent pixels... We're not necessarily in adjacent bytes in memory. Uh, that sounds like a one. There were like seven <laughs> pixels in it adjacent, and then a skip one that was for shifting them right. all over a little to get that the color. That sounds like a hacks. Yeah, a bit of a hack. So <laughs> if you're going to copy memory onto the screen, you need one routine. If you're going right. to copy memory from the screen to the screen, you need another. And oh. memory to memory and a screen to memory, you need. So this, all, everything had to have four copies of everything. The other thing that happened then is I had to plug in the disk routines. And their system was pretty big. And that little 13-sector floppy disks weren't, didn't have a lot of capacity. Well, WAS had just come up with a different way of encoding the data on the disk so that we could get more data for the same, um, same disk size. And we needed the 16-sector disk routines. And so WAS came down. and. Uh, I was there. I had never bothered to get a, a motel because I slept on the bench when I wasn't working. <laughs> I, this is in in the computer science lab at, at UC San Diego. I was busy. I didn't have time to do, no, yeah. you know, go sleep. That was, you know. <laughs> but Waz came down, and I got to interact with him, and it was really fun because he would go. He's working and on installing these 16-sector disk driver routines, and he go type 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 type, and he didn't type in assembly language and have it assemble. No, he typed in. Uh, 6502 machine code. Machine code oh, hex. man. He typed in hex. Oh, man. And then I, <laughs> you know, watching him type, and he'd go, like, type, 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 type. And when he finished, I asked him, well, what was the pause? Oh, it was a forward branch, seven instructions. I had to compute the offset before I continued. <laughs> so he didn't back patch the offset. Holy he actually uh, looked at He's... what he was going to be typing, knew how many bytes it would take. He was brilliant. Oh, man. But he also wasn't a computer scientist. Uh, he ended up with object code. Right. I had to disassemble it to make a listing. <laughs> and I had to go to that listing and try to comment what he, what he was doing what with everything. What's going on and here? Bring it to him and it said, you know, is, is this, this right? Is this really uh, is this annotation correct? Right. And he was kind of amazed that I could figure out what he was doing from what the code was. <laughs>
He was a hacker in the best sense of the yeah, word. Yeah, he best was sense brilliant. Of the word. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So I guy. got to work with him. Uh, I sh we shouldn't say was, is. Still is. a wonderful guy, yeah. Bill Atkinson is our guest. Uh, we're going to have some more in just a bit, but I have to take a little break here to talk about one of the tools that people are using to do exactly that. It's an, an, we live in such an interesting time for somebody who wants to create software or to, to, uh, to invent something. And things like DigitalOcean are really a remarkable tool for people who want, if you're, if you're a developer and you have an idea, you can spin up a server on DigitalOcean in under a minute. You can, you can build your device, you can create a, a, a minimal viable product instantly. And I'm gonna do it right now. Let me log into my uh, DigitalOcean account. I'm now in DigitalOcean because <laughs> I wanted to spin up an instance. This is what DigitalOcean calls them droplets. They're virtual private servers. Uh, you can customize them, you can deploy them, it's easy to do. You can host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, almost anything you can think of. You have full root access. Let me show you. On my, uh, This is my DigitalOcean. I'm going to create a droplet. The first thing you're going to do is choose your OS. And look at all the OSs. FreeBSD, Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, CoreOS, CentOS. I don't even know what those are. <laughs> They're different operating systems. But you also can start with an image. Let's say you wanted to do a wiki. So you're going to say, I'm going to install MediaWiki. Then you then choose your size. Starting at $5 a month or 0.7 cents an hour. You can actually go by that. And I'm going to choose that. And you can always make it bigger if you want. And let's, shall we, shall we spin this up? My data center, we'll make it local. I can also add things like backups. That's a buck a month. If I want IPv6, I can do it. And of course, I use my SSH keys so I don't have to use a password to log in. I'm going to create a droplet. Watch this. Now I'm going to start creating the do droplet. And literally, in under a minute, I have provisioned a server, which I can now use. I can log in with root access. I can set up a mail server. I can set up Django. I can do anything I want to do on the web, digitalocean.com. And we're going to have you a special deal here where you can do this for free because once you create an account on DigitalOcean, confirm your email, go to the billing section, enter the promo code triangulation, you get a $10 credit. That means that's two months of, uh, of, of one of these servers. There, it's done. I can get to work right now. I can log in via the console. I can resize it. I can do all sorts of things. And, of course, when I'm done, I destroy it. I'm now logged into my provisioned server there's my public ip address there's the gateway there's the net mask and now because i'm on my uh, my um, my mac here i can uh, share the ssh key and i've got a login that's secure i love this robert uses it he's i think he's doing a wordpress uh, install uh, among other things uh, many of the people randall uh, schwartz uses it many of the people who work here on twit use it a lot of programmers do it is the fastest growing cloud infrastructure provi infrastructure provider Built for developers, easy to use, simple and elegant solutions, digitalocean.com. And you get it for free for a couple of months. Digitalocean.com, just use the pro promo code triangulation after you create your account. You know what I love about Waz? He never got full of himself. He is a teddy bear, and yep. he enjoys yep. being an engineer. He yep. never wanted to be a manager. He never yep. wanted to lord it over people, and you know, he, he never had to do uh, employee reviews, that kind of bureaucratic stuff. And um, I bet he'd I like say that. the same thing about you. Hmm. I've always been an engineer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and boy, your enthusiasm shines through. We're talking to Bill Atkinson. God, there's so much. Uh, you got about five or six hours because there's so much I want to talk to you. We well, can't obviously. Why don't, we, but why don't you shoot what we, you can and you can second, edit it down to a smaller we'll thing. We'll do a second show if you can come back up. Are you you're living in the South Bay now? I live in Portola Valley. Yeah, beautiful. It's, yeah. It took me. Uh, I budgeted two and a half hours to get here, and it took me less than two. Nice. So I was here early, waiting for you um, to come. I in. know. I was. I'm just too. <laughs> uh, too see, that's the truth. The person lives farther. Gets here earlier. The person who lives just you know two out two miles away is always going to be late, right? Well, I, I have plenty of time to get there. I didn't want to be late. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And you brought so many fun things. I want to see some of your photographs. Uh, I, I this is just a lot to talk about. Bill Atkinson is here, um, the creator of uh, everything that is good in the world. It seems sometimes. No, no, I, no, no. I am so grateful, and I use a Macintosh every day, all the time. And I bet you there's still some Quick Draw in there, isn't there? Um, the original quick draw is no longer in there. It's gone. Uh, the with uh, the advent of uh, OS 10 and they iOS, replaced it all. Yeah, 
completely replaced. And it's not in ROM anymore either, is it? It's now it's no, uh, software. Not it's needed. Software. It doesn't need to be in ROM. Yeah. yeah. But, but uh, it, uh, you know, it inspired I wrote it. the first version of QuickDraw. You did. Draw. You did. I think Bruce Leak made some improvements later, uh, like colorizing it. The first yeah. version was only black and white. Yeah, yeah. And I wrote the original version of Mac Paint, and other people Copy carried bits. on on that. Copy bits is legendary. I had to make it fast enough that people could use it. If you're making a word processor and you need the text to scroll up, really, you have to copy this to there. Yeah. Now, what the Lisa did at first, and they thought this was sort of a cheap shot, is they made in the video display, there was a, a list of pointers that pointed to where the memory was for these. So that if they wanted to scroll up, all they had to do was change the pointers. Right. But that only works if you're scrolling the entire screen. Right. If you want to scroll the contents of a window, it's, it's useless. And they never used it. Oh. But I had to make QuickDraw fast enough that real apps could use it. And I think having applications using my work really was a great inspiration. Mm. I would see, OK, where is this too slow for practicality? Mm -hmm. What can I do about that? I think of it as a performance a debugging. Like when you have real users using this stuff, and you then watch you them. write stuff that's yeah. better. I think the, yeah. the original Lisa apps, there was like seven apps. Um, they were really important for developing the system things so that other people could do real apps. Yeah. There was yeah. a one point where I uh, had to come up with a way to draw quickly against a non-rectangular area. You know, if you have a, a window and another one overlapping, well, there's sort of an L-shaped yeah. piece left over. And yeah. if you have rounded corners on things, it's yeah. not even that. It's a mess, yeah. And at the time, drawing into a non-rectangular area was really, really slow. If you use like a, a SIG graph, graphics things, it was oh maybe 150, 200 times too slow to use in a real app. And when I did this visit to Xerox, um, we'd already had overlapping windows on, the, on, on our uh, prototype, on the, on the Lisa. But what I saw that impressed me was that a window moved and the window behind refreshed only to its area. I thought, wow, they can do non, non Rectangular Regions. region yeah. clipping, yeah. you know, and um, I knew then that it was possible, and so I figured out a way to do it oh, efficiently. That's awesome. Now, what I found out later was that I miss saw that <laughs> they were doing. They only it. drew a rectangle and, re and had to redrew everybody oh. on top. Blip, 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 blip. And they asked you... me, <laughs> how, so one that? of the guys that worked there asked me, how did you do that region <laughs> thing? I said, well, didn't you guys do it? <laughs> So sometimes um, believing that something is possible actually makes it possible. That's if amazing. I hadn't seen what I thought was an existence proof, I would have known it was Can't just not Can't practical do to do that quickly. Yeah. Wow. Do you feel like the Macintosh kind of came, to, I, I, I don't know how to describe this, sometimes things come together as if they're meant to be. And sometimes it's more of a struggle. What was the experience of, of, of creating the Macintosh? Was it something that, it kind of all clicked, or was it every step of the way you had to work to make it happen? Hmm, somewhere in between, both. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of hard work. Yeah. There was a lot of rushing. Oh, yes. A lot of, uh, uh, oh, there was some sort of bad politics at Apple, this race oh, between God, the Lisa yeah. team and the Mac team, yeah. and John Couch and Steve Jobs and all that. Were you ta Were you plucked by Steve from the Mac and the yeah, Lisa I was team? An, I was the first honorary member of both teams. Ah. I was part of the Lisa team. Because he did raid the company, and, didn't he? I mean, to get the Mac yeah, team together. Yeah. yeah. Um, he wanted to take the best and brightest. Right. And But I was already, I, before he even did any of that, I was already part of both teams. Yeah. Uh, I think QuickDraw was a necessary ingredient to right. uh, the Macintosh. And so I was kind of on both teams. Yeah. Uh, Mac Paint, Steve Jobs wanted a structured graphics editor, like Mac Draw became. Right. And... And I uh, said, I want something more thing. informal that people yeah. can just draw and paint, yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, I'm, I'm glad I stuck to my guns on that and made something that was user-friendly instead of business-friendly. Hello. I didn't want to make yep. Adobe Illustrator. Yeah. You know, I wanted yeah. to make... Uh, a bitmap some, editor. Yeah. 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 That beautiful program. And uh, w did Susan Kerr use, uh, use it to create her uh, famous icons? We yes, have one here, yes. by the way. So <laughs> Susan Kerr, I... I actually have to um, say that Susan was a co-designer of MacPaint. And how that is, is that she would use it, and I'd right. watch. 
Right. And when I see that she was stuck on something or something was really hard to do, that would go into my head and I think, okay, maybe not just what she wants to do, but there's a, that is a subset of a bigger scope of things that could be done if I had this other concept that was simpler. And I'd bring her a new version and she'd be just amazed. Oh, I she can didn't do that ask now. for the feature that I wanted, but right. I would watch her using it. And what was the, was the big bits, the, the thing? Fat bits. Fat bits. Okay, okay. Was that, was that inspired? I bet it was. She's uh, doing, a, you want to, she wants fat bits, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll oh, show here you. Here comes the, something out of his magic, magic My box. life in license plates. <laughs> Where did they go? You brought license plates? I'll tell you what, I I'll give you a chance to bits. look for it. We're going to take a break. I have it right here. Here it is. Oh, here it is. Uh -oh, you're, remember, you're just, wired. You can't. You just can't. unplug the mic. <laughs> oh, you're still there. You're good. You still got audio? Yeah, we sound great. Okay. Oh, look, he brought his life. His life. Fat bits brings that up. Oh, this is awesome. I was working on, so in California, when you turned in your plate, yeah. you get another one. Yeah. You only had to turn in the back one that had the stickers on it. Oh, so, so I always the kept the front one. Good man. And so when I was working on the quick draw, I was craft man. Oh, good. All right. When I was working on Mac Paint, <laughs> I was Fat Bits. <laughs> this was on my brown Corvette. <laughs> when I was working on Hypercard, I was Oh, Hypercard. I love it. When I was working uh, at General Magic, I was GM oh, Magic. Oh, I love that. And my current plate is BA Space Photo. Perfect. People have asked me, why do you have a plate that says Badass Photo? <laughs> said, no, 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 it's Bill Atkinson <laughs> Photo. I'm BA. <laughs> We're going to, this, Bill is being so generous with his time. He's given us so much of his time today. Uh, we're going to talk, we're going to actually chop this triangulation up into two shows. So that's part one, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, next week on Triangulation, James Gosling, the creator of Java, will be here. Uh, we'll be at NAB the following week. But in a couple of weeks, we'll give you part two of our conversation with the amazing uh, Bill Atkinson. I'm just so grateful to have this time with you, Bill. Thank you. Um, we do triangulation, it's amazing, isn't it? We do triangulation every uh, Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's, uh, let's see, 1800 UTC. You can watch live. If you do, be in, be in the chat room, please, because uh, your questions, your feedback really helps make this show, irc.twit.tv. If you can't be here live, on-demand audio and video, always available after the fact, twit.tv slash TRI on YouTube. Uh, you can subscribe in your favorite podcatcher or get one of the great Twit apps. They're on every platform thanks to those fabulous independent third-party developers who've written these wonderful uh, things for us. We thank you all. Uh, but whatever, whatever way you get here, please don't miss an episode. Again, next week, James Gosling, NAB, and more to come with the legendary Bill Atkins. Thanks for, thanks for being here. We'll see you next time on Train. Nation.